حسين مني وأنا من حسين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد عظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بسيد الشهداء أبا عبد الله الحسين عليه السلام And the next guest on the podcast is LD شيخ نمي فرحات هواوي السلام عليكم شيخنا عليكم السلام ورحمة الله عظم الله أجوركم uh, just uh, this platform, the podcast, this episode, it's about the personalized experience of the Sheikh. We're going to dissect and get to the bottom of his relationship with Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam and the Ashura commemoration. And the start is how did it start, Sheikh? You know, as a youth, as a youngster, what are your fond first memories of uh, Majalis of Al Hussein alayhi salam? I think. Um... It's the same story with every Shia uh, person that is raised in a Shia family. Um, the first thing he witnessed every Muharram is his parents uh, commemorating the martyrdom of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. And uh, although uh, in some families we come from a more uh, cultural uh, background and religious background, but with that we see that uh, everyone had a special relation with Imam al that um, men, women used to sit and cry. And uh, now if I want to remember and to go back in memory uh, to, uh, to when I first started having this relation with uh, Imam al Hussein I think it was in Lebanon, when I was uh, in Lebanon. Uh, after uh, after my parents moved uh, to Lebanon from here, uh, I remember on the tenth day of uh, Muharram, they 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 used to have a, a big march in uh, Lebanon, especially in uh, Dahi on the tenth day. So we used to go down and uh, walk uh, with them a distance for an hour, and then uh, end uh, listening to a speech by one of the scholars there. And listen to the majlis. So from an early age, yes, I, I opened my eyes, uh, seeing my parents commemorating and also joining uh, the Shia in Lebanon, commemorating uh, the martyrdom of Imam al Now as well as yourself, you're now a scholar, alhamdulillah. From a uh, scholar's perspective, jurisprudentially, is there a responsibility uh, for parents to teach them the love of Al Muhammad and to take them to Majalis Al Hussein alayhi salam. Um, from a religious aspect, I, I think yes, we can classify it as a responsibility uh, for the parents to teach their children about Islam, to educate them about uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Um, and uh, even the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Ahlul Bayt because they are the ones that uh, interpret to us the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need them uh, to, to learn our religion and to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and the Quran also mentions one of, in one of the verses, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةَ I ask you no reward but to show love to my new relatives. So in that sense, we can say it is a religious responsibility for parents to educate uh, their children and to make them connect, especially knowing that uh, as a youth, you need a role model. So to, to plant this love of the Ahlul Bayt and make them your, the role models of your children would be better than them having a role model as a singer or an actor or someone else.
Yeah, and no, definitely, most definitely. And if I'm not mistaken, Sheikh Wahid al Khurasani is actually placed an obligation on his followers. Uh, obligation, maybe not from a, a fiqhi aspect, maybe okay. as a social obligation in that, in that sense, maybe. Okay, yeah. So nonetheless, that it's very important. And you saw uh, in Lebanon, in Jabal Amal, the uh, the galvanization, you know, because there is a Husseini movement, and as well due to occupied forces. It's probably more so, and it's a bit more spiritually connected, you could say, than it is here in Australia. Well, when you can practice the theories that you're commemorating, obviously you connect more to it. And when you can, we can't compare anything to the to the tragedy of Ashura, but when you can live some of these uh, incidents of oppression, of uh, fighting uh, the oppressors, of uh, standing alone, then yes, you'll connect. You'll have a stronger connection with the uh, with the cause. <clears throat> Most definitely. And then yourself, so you were exposed to that from your parents, a baraka of your family, and then you move on and you do what others don't. Most others don't do. So now you commit to the path of Muhammad al Muhammad, and you go into the Hausa Seminary. What was the inspiration and motivation behind that move? Because it's a move that a lot say, but not a lot do. Uh, so again, because of from an early age, I was uh, in that environment, religious environment, uh, after my parents moved from Australia to Lebanon. Um, I was uh, living in uh, Dahi, around scholars there, and some famous scholars who were known some of them passed away. Uh, so I was always into that uh, environment of Hausa. Not Hausa, as Hausa, I didn't know what Hausa is back then, but like the religious environment. And then after, I think, moving back to Australia, when I was still 11 or 12, so uh, I saw there's a big difference between the where I was living and the new environment that I found myself in, especially when I went to school, because I didn't go to a, a private or an Islamic school. I went to a public school. And uh, so it was a shocking uh, thing to see. And out of fear of uh, losing myself, I think, back then, um, I became more religious uh, than before. And even I remember in the school, although most of the uh, Muslims, they were not Shia, but uh, still we were very close and we, uh, I made sure to have a, a, a Salat every day at the school. <laughs> we made sure to have a class uh, free and to have Salat every day. And I was leading the Salat there with the, with the, with the students, uh, pretending to be a Sheikh. And I think they started from there and I kept pre pretending to now. To be, to be a sheikh. Nah, and, look, that's the humility. I'll speak on behalf of him there. Yeah, no, sorry, continue, Sheikh. No. And then from there, I decided I finished school a bit early. I finished year 12 a bit early. And um, I decided I was good at school, alhamdulillah. So my parents, uh, especially my dad, he had some hope in me becoming something. Uh, doctor, and lawyer, or something like that. Like with most of the Lebanese, I think, family. So I said to him, no, I'm going to Hausa. And it was a shocking thing for him. Uh, they didn't accept, so I had to work uh, in secret, to prepare for it in secret. And then on the same day that I was leaving, I told them that I'm leaving on that day. And then I went overseas. <laughs> so that's the, that's the reason that caused me to go to Hausa. So it's the environment, the shock of environment. I mean, you came from somewhere, came somewhere else and... You know, like everyone else, I'll probably see it the opposite. Because when I went to Iraq in the last trip that I did, and when I went to Iran, especially Qom, you know, what I thought it was, I thought I was back in a time machine back towards the days of the Prophet. So that shock I had, but in reverse to what you're saying. So I most definitely understand that. Yeah, well, I, I, I also I remember when I went to, uh, to Iran, um, and especially when, when we came towards Qom, and the borders of Qom back then, um, I was shocked seeing the old buildings, the roads, and uh, 
even the most shocking one was seeing uh, scholars on motorbikes, riding the motorbikes, you know, with their families, with their kids. So I'm like, what's going on here? There's a time machine, I'm going back by time. So it was a bit, bit shocking, but uh, alhamdulillah, it was a good experience with the positive and the negative things in it. Most definitely. And bringing it back to Muharram, Ashura, yourself, you know, so the stance of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, once you in the house here now, I know a lot of people take the Husseini route and then some people take the more scholarly jurisprudential route, if I'm not mistaken. What route was yours? Where were you more tempted? And, you know, what pushed you to further your studies in that sense? Um, look, everyone, as we said, they, everyone must have a role, role models for them in life. Or they look up to certain people. And I think due to the environment that I was raised in, in, in Lebanon, um, most, if not all the scholars that I knew from an early age were more into the Husseini, uh, let's say, active part of Islam. So, so none of them were uh, a passive scholar that is just limited to books and uh, teaching and all that. They were all active into politics, into standing against the oppressors and that. So it, I can't deny that it, uh, it influenced me a lot or this environment influenced me a lot. And in the Hausa, obviously, you go to the people that think the same as you. So even in the Hausa, my friends, my teachers, uh, and they are on in Lebanon because I moved to the house there in Lebanon. It was uh, part of uh, that path, the active path. Uh, but uh, this doesn't mean that we don't uh, we don't concentrate on the fiqh aspect of religion or on the theoretical aspect. In fact, I believe for you to be active as a Husseini uh, person, you must be a scholar and you must be in the highest level of fiqh, in the highest level of uh, understanding your religion in order for you to apply it in a proper way uh, outside. Yeah, no, most definitely. So then your path is set and you continue to do what you do and you come back to Australia and inshallah, your continuous service of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Now, when we talk about Imam Hussein alayhi salam, a lot of people yeah. limit Imam Hussein alayhi salam to the stands on the 10th of Muharram in Karbala, which is a great injustice to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. So how do you see the events of Karbala? I know it starts from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. As a speaker, what is the most emphasis you put on Imam Hussein alayhi salam stands, especially for contemporary modern society? So I think the, the most, the most uh, let's say, the, the lesson that people concentrate on when it comes to Imam Hussein alayhi salam is his stance that he took against the oppression. And they can relate to that especially as we said in certain countries, they can relate to that. In fact, Muharram became, or Ashuram became that famous uh, due to that fact, due, or due to that reason, because people uh, uh, connected to it and they were able to see that it, they can relate due to the things that uh, they are going through. But obviously, um, as you said, Imam Hussain uh, shouldn't be limited to 10 days of uh, Muharram. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam should be studied from uh, an early age of his life when um, when he was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the relation that he had with Rasulullah uh, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Uh, some of the mustahabbat that are mentioned in Islam and uh, which are linked to Imam al Hussein, for example, the seven takbirat that we do as an istihbab. Uh, before Salah, they say this is linked to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam because uh, he didn't uh, spe speak straight away when he was a kid. And one day the Prophet was doing takbir and Imam al Hussein started speaking, saying his first words, Allahu Akbar. So the Prophet said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar seven times because of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And it became Mustahab later on, based on that narration now that is mentioned. All the story with, uh, with the relation that he had with Sayyid al-Zahra alayhi salam, with Imam Ali alayhi salam, the political stance that he took uh, after the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in facing some of those who stood against his father, Imam Ali alayhi salam, uh, the obedient stance that he took with his uh, brother, Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, when he signed the treaty with Muawiyah, uh, maybe 
maybe I'm saying Imam Razi alayhi salam uh, is viewed as uh, more as a revolutionary person, but with that he was obedient uh, to, to, the, to, to the decision of his brother. And then uh, it's important to look at the incidents that took place after the martyrdom of Imam Hassan alayhi salam and all the way to, uh, to, to Muharram or to the to, to, to year 61 after Hijrah. Because it can help us to understand why Imam Hussain ended up uh, in Karbala and why did he do uh, this uh, movement? Yeah, most definitely, Sheikh. And look, if we're going to help the audience or if anyone to benefit from this episode, inshallah, we're just going to touch on as many things as we can to try and put a context to what a lot of people misinterpret. You know, something with me that bothers me the most is the uh, people who continuously attack the Shia of Kufa. Far too long people come and slam Kufa, 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 and Habibi, you're what, Lebanese? What about Alba? What about Medina, Mecca? Well, Ansar al Hussein didn't just arrive and it didn't wake up in Kufa. And a lot of people bother me, especially these keyboard warriors when there's no context. I don't understand what they're saying and how they are delivering such a message and how out of context it is. And inshallah, if we can, you know, in this episode, put to light the context behind that. And to do so, I think we have to start from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Was Imam al Hussein, as Sayyid Hadi my favorite line, is Khat Ahmar from the time of the Holy Prophet? Was the Holy Prophet mourning for Abu Abdullah before anyone else? So, 100%, the, 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 the incident of um, Muharram or the incident of Karbala. Uh, was mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In fact, it can be looked upon as a prophecy from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And maybe we can use the narrations that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa delivered um, in regards to Karbala and the tragedy of Imam Hussain alayhi salam as an evidence for his, for his prophethood. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was uh, informing people about a certain incident that will happen in the future. He mentioned to them the time. He mentioned to them the place. He mentioned to them uh, the, the way that his grandson is going to be killed. He showed them uh, some of the soil of Karbala when he gave it to Um Salam and said it will turn to blood. So with all these details, he's speaking about something that will happen in the future is, uh, is a sign for his prophethood. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen many people um, shedding light on 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 this uh, on this point uh, on how to or how to use Karbala to, to prove the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa This is when it comes to Ashura or mourning Imam al Hussein alayhi salam uh, from the Prophet and all the way to Imam Ali alayhi salam and 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 the rest of the Imams. Uh, when it comes to Kufa, because you spoke about Kufa. Uh, obviously, it is not hidden how racist many people are, or let's say some people, just to say to state politically correct, some people, some people are very racist, you know, and they always uh, look at Iraqis in general in a negative way. They call them Kufa, people of Kufa, um, and it became more difficult or they became more racist due to certain political um, chants that became famous uh, after the revolution in uh, the Islamic revolution in Iran. So uh, people in Iran, they, 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 chant, they have a chant, chant. They say in Farisi, Mo Ahli Kufin Esteem, we are not the people of Kufa to leave Ali alone. Right? And um, the truth is, uh, when we look at Kufa, we see that it is a place that the Ahlul Bayt salam, concentrated on. There's no, uh, let's call it infallible place or infallible community. There's good and bad people everywhere. But the truth should be said that the best of Shia, they come from Kufa. The best of Shia, they come from Kufa. Now, it's not about how many but we should see that the, some of the best of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt were from Kufa. And it is not right to say that the people of Kufa betrayed Imam Hussain This is not correct. 
Number one, keep in mind that I don't like to speak about uh, sects in Islam, but most of the people back then were not even Shia uh, in Iran. And number two, uh, a lot of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, were forced or they were in prison before, before Karbala. They were put in prison before, before Karbala. So a lot of people, uh, they tried to protect the Ahlul Bayt or defend Ahlul Bayt. Obviously, some of them betrayed, same as in uh, any, any country. Any country, like go to any country, go to Lebanon, Iran, uh, any place, you'll find some people that are good, some people that are bad. But to generalize or to be racist in uh, viewing uh, the people of Kufa, this is very bad. Especially knowing that it's going to be the capital of Imam al Mahdi, I'm sure it would be a, a good place for him to recognize as his capital. Yeah, no, Ahsan Sheikh, no. And look, it, it comes with a lot of people. They wish to negate that it was the capital of the first and their last Imam, and that Kufa is a stronghold, and there's a reason for that. And even Masjid al Kufa, the significance it does have. And for me, yeah. I've always concentrated on the term Ansar al Hussein. Ansar al Hussein was individuals who came from different tribes and different areas as he approached Karbala. And, you know, for me, it's like, especially when I read these Facebook comments, because they're the ones that bother me most. And it's people from my community, my people who are saying, the pe don't be like the Shia of Kufa. I'm looking about your Lebanese, don't be like the Shia of uh, Baalbek, Lebanon. That was a stop, mm. that was a pit stop on the way. I mean, why are we looking at someone else? Look at your own backyard. So that's mm. what bothers me about that. And they also negate that if you look at the army of Abu Abdullah, it's all Kufa. You look at your um, Bani Assad, you look at Habib al Mudahir, Muslim Ma'awsaja, Kufa, Kufa, Kufa. Mm. I mean, they, they did have a big representation in Kufa. And like you said, Mukhtar al-Thakafi was in prison. And also, I can ask us where there was a bloodbath. Ibn Ziyad didn't come in with good intentions. 100%. Look, uh, even when they use the term Shia, say Shia al Kufa, it doesn't mean they're referring to a, a, a theological school of thought. The Shia are the supporters. So same as you have the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt, you have the Shia of Ben Umayyah, for example. Historically, not uh, in Iraq, most of the people were not from the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, that's number one. But as you said, some of the people from the from the Kufa, they stood with Imam Hussein, so it's wrong for us to generalize, and um, and we, sh we should uh, try to be just in the way we look at things. No one is better than uh, uh, the, the other person because of the country that they belong to. These are things that don't matter. 100%. And that's the attitude of the pagan Arabs in the days of Jahiliyyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came and said, Inna akramakum and Allah You know, it's God conscious, it's taqwa. And that's about kufa. However, if we racism, go back... No, no. Racism, by the way, exists everywhere, you know? Oh, for sure, yeah. No, no, Arabs. I can tell you once, uh, for example, the story when I was in, in Iran a few years ago, Ziyara. And in the haram of Imam al-Ridha, alayhi salam, um, I was standing next to the Barih, and then a man came, an Iranian guy came and he asked me a question, a fiqh question about Safar, uh, traveling and about his Salat, Qasr, Tama, and that stuff. So I answered his question in Arabic. He asked me in Farsi, but I answered in, in Arabic because my Farsi is not that good. So I can understand, but to speak is a bit difficult for me. And I can express myself better, obviously, in Arabic. So I answered him in Arabic. Then from nowhere, this Iranian guy came up and he's like, why are you asking this Arab? There, there are many uh, Iranian scholars. Why are you asking this Arab? So I was trying to be diplomatic. I'm like, look, uh, I, had, I had a friend with me, one of the chefs who was translating to me. I said, look, uh, we are all the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. There's no difference between an Arab and an Arab. It's not about the language. We have a common language, which, which is the love of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. Then from nowhere, he's like, no, no, uh, uh, this is, uh, Arabic is Zabani Shimr. Zabani Shimr means the language of Shimr. Oh, wow. Yeah. I said to him, okay, I want you to remember something every time you stand to pray. He said to me, what? Well, I told him, you can't speak to Allah except through the language of Shimr. And then he started going crazy inside the Dariya. <laughs> So racism, it does exist everywhere. But when we return to the teachings of the, uh, to the Quran, Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa we see that they, they tried their best to fight racism. 
Yes, most definitely. And the Iranians in general, I'll say it myself, they're very patriotic. I know, I know they're always at each other's throats with the United States. And, you know, they both have that similar trait of patriotism. And unfortunately, the people aren't always a representation of the religion. You know, the comedian says it best. Muslims are all about peace. A peace here, a peace there, a peace everywhere. So we're not generalizing, obviously. There's well, yeah, 100%. Back. Oh, yeah, 100% not generalizing. However, it is a thing because a lot of the youth do see that and get turned off, unfortunately. And that's their excuse or that's their reason. I don't come to the mosque because I'm in shorts and people are looking at me. Or they, you know, the spotlight effect, they feel that everyone's eyes are on them, especially because they don't feel that they belong in this place. And the shaitan does play his games in these places, as we know. So mm -hmm. it's just important for people watching, knowing that. It, 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 the best of people face that it's happened in history it'll happen again it'll happen to everyone yes 100 percent. so then when we're looking at the seerah of the prophet peace be upon him i'll go back to that we look at when imam al-hussein al-islam was born there was news the holy prophet peace be upon him wanted to hide from fatima what was the importance of this event because then we now know the intercession of abba abdullah and the importance of mourning and commemorating uh, the Ashura and Muharram commemoration was a sunnah of Rasulullah then? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, hundred, look, um, I'm not going to go in depth about the different narrations that exist, right? Because I don't want to fall into using some of the narrations or incidents that may not be that authentic. But in general, we say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was informed about uh, what's going to happen to Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam when he was born. And there's a, it's like he, he was compared to Ismail alayhi salam, how Ismail alayhi salam was, uh, how Ibrahim was asked to sacrifice his son and how uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was also uh, asked, let's say, to uh, sacrifice or was told that his son will, will, will end up sacrificing himself for the sake of Islam. Now, in some, in some uh, books, they, they say that he had to choose between either his son or Imam al-Hussein, that you can't have both of them. So one of them has to stay alive, one of them has to, to die. Regardless of the authenticity of these narrations, we find that he knew that something is going to happen to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And um, he didn't want to inform uh, anyone about it so they don't uh, uh, feel upset from, uh, from, uh, from the first days of the birth of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. But it is mentioned that um, he informed that anyone that uh, remembers Imam al Hussein or cries on Imam al Hussein alayhi salam will receive the intercession of the Prophet on the Day of Judgment. Inshallah, we're all granted such an intercession and the blessing of Rasulullah and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. So we see from that, now the Holy Prophet has a unique relationship with Abba Abdullah. And it's it's something that's foreign to the, the pagan Arabs because they don't usually show affection. How is that lesson of the relationship between Rasulullah and Abba Abdullah al-Husayn alayhi al salatu wasalam Important for us to reflect in this day and age when we're raising our kids, when we're interacting with children, and how we should come about it in this day and age. Yeah, look, I always use the term, uh, although it has a bit of a negative aspect to it, but I still use it. I say the Prophet ﷺ was an emotional person, emotional person, meaning that he used to uh, show his emotions and he didn't fear to show his emotions. Even with the Ahlul Bayt and the rest, uh, so he made sure to to show his love to, to everyone, including Imam Hussein um, it, it, it is certainly a great lesson, especially for the parents. But no matter how important you are, and no matter how big you think you are. Uh, it's good to have a very close relation with your children and to raise them or even to play with them. We see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, although he was a, a prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, receiving revelation. He was a leader of a nation. He was a political leader. And with that, he used to 
crawl on the ground and let Imam al Hussein and Imam al Hussein go on, on top of his back. And even when he's praying, he's doing sujood, if they go on top of his back, he used to uh, take long in his sujood. You know, <clears throat> he used to play with his grandchildren, sit down on the floor and, and, and play with them. Maybe today, if you see someone, I don't know, that you think is important, a certain, let's say, marja or a certain politician doing that, you say, oh, this is not appropriate to be done. But this was not done uh, privately inside the house, even outside in public. They mentioned that once the Prophet ﷺ was giving a speech in the masjid, and look at the masjid not as our mosques today. The masjid was like the parliament house for the, for the, for the, for the people in Medina, for the new Islamic state. And the, 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 <laughs> the prime minister or the, the leader was standing, Rasulullah ﷺ giving a khutbah. And then Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, they entered to the mosque. So he left the khutbah and he went down to kiss Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. And then he continued his speech. So he showed his emotions as a, as a grandfather, as a father for them. And also he used to do it uh, intentionally, to do it publicly, intentionally to show the importance of respecting and loving the members of his household. Most definitely. And I feel it's a lesson, and it's a lesson that's really neglected when we're looking at the seerah of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Because in our communities, I speak about myself, I don't speak about anyone. It's more so it's a sign of weakness if you show your child too much love or affection or attention, or if you're a bit soft or, you know, and it's, but he needs to be a rajal and you don't want him to be a jaban or whatever they go on and say. And every time I see it, I'm like, bro, I want to really slap you, to be honest, but I'm going to conduct myself in a better way. But I don't know what you're talking about. And it really bothers me because, again, it's like that jahali al-ula. We're in a continuous state of ignorance because we don't reflect and we don't actually take the lessons and actually make them practical. It's, so, it's almost like history and it's khalas, it's a tarikh and it's in a book and that's it. No, look, most definitely it's wrong to oppress the emotions of the children, especially the children. When you come to a child, don't, don't do this, don't cry, uh, don't uh, show weakness in front of uh, others, you're a man, right? It will affect them in a negative way. But allowing them to express their emotions, with the balance of this, with having the balance, and expressing, expressing their emotions will make them stronger in the future. Hiding the, the, your emotions uh, will help for a certain period of time. But one day they will explode in front of you, suddenly explode, and they make you go into a very depressing uh, moment or depressing uh, life. So this is something we see with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that used to express his emotion. Yani being even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he used to express his love to his wife publicly. Right? And he used to encourage people to express the love uh, for their wives, right? with respect, obviously. And uh, uh, let me clarify on that so it doesn't use like it's not used against me. For example, <laughs> after the death of Khadija uh, the Prophet Ali, when uh, he used to see the the what's it called the friends of Khadija السلام, he used to remember Khadija and cry. Right? And he used to give out food donations on behalf of Khadija out of love for Khadija And it is mentioned that he says uh, the, the saying of a man to his wife, I love you, would never leave her heart. So he was a very romantic person in expressing his emotion, which is a good thing. Imam Ali alayhi salam that was raised by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He says, Ana Rabibu, the Prophet says, Ana Rabibu Allah wa Aliun Rabibi. I was taught by Allah and I taught Ali. We saw Imam Ali alayhi salam, no one is the strong, was stronger than him. He is known as the warrior of Islam, the strongest man in the battlefield. But with that, people used to hear him crying like a child at night while praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so he was, in that sense, he used to show his emotions uh, to, uh, in front of people. It was not, I mean, it was not a sign of weakness, uh, weakness to, to do that. But uh, maybe we need to manage these emotions that we have, especially with our children, to manage how they express the, their emotions and how they react emotionally, on what? To, 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 to be emotional in, uh, in, in crying, in, in having a strong relation with Allah, this is something positive. But to break up uh, crying, for example, and uh, 
being depressed, for example, because a girl, a girl blocked you on Instagram, this is not a good reason, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's not that like they need a slap on their face and you wake up to yourself. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we need to manage these emotions. 100%, most definitely. And I'll speak about myself because I've never, we have never had the honor and experience of meeting Al Muhammad and seeing how, you know, we know that Bani Hashim were warriors and they were known for their valor. And we don't, we don't really know. So whatever our methods are, we try to, you know, we try to make up and justify to ourselves. However, I can guarantee you and tell you, I've been in world championship camps where head coaches and people are fighting for world titles. I've been in boxing and MMA. And you see the way that they uh, interact with one another. And you think that he's training a youngster. It's like not serious. The vibe is there. Their gym energy is good. And they never put in one another down. And it's, it's the simple things. It's A, B, Cs of everything. It's fundamentals. Once you get the fundamentals right, even in life, you perfect the fundamentals, it takes you a long way. When's your world title? I know that in fighting. And I know that the ways that most my upbringing and the communities that I've seen, it's most definitely not going to get you a world champion. It's actually going to do the opposite, like you mentioned. Someone's going to turn to depression. Someone's going to run away from the religion. And they're going to, you know, and even religiously. Am I mistaken in saying that if someone who's, wearing a turban or wearing the haqiq or conducting themselves in a religious manner, harm someone? Are they not punished double because they've deterred someone? Yes, 100%. 100%. Like, look, if, if, uh, if someone is strong and secure, there's no need for them to show that strength and they would not fear to express themselves, even emotionally, because they are strong, secure. But when someone is weak, and he, he's insecure. They try to hide this weakness and insecurity through trying to present themselves as tough people. So when you see people trying to act tough in the way they talk by being hot-headed, staunching, and uh, the, the way they walk, even physically walking, yeah, they bench 20 kilos and then they walk yeah, like as if they are, <laughs> as if they are sure, yeah, warriors. Uh, don't be aggressive when, when you see such people. In fact, I, I personally, I try to help them out because I feel sorry for them. I know that they are struggling. Although they try to put everyone down, they try to, uh, to show themselves as strong, but deep down, deep down, they are in need of help. Uh, and this is why uh, yeah, I mean, we should try our best to help them out when, when they see them, if they want, obviously, to, to, help, to help them out. But uh, strong people, as you said, strong people never have a problem in expressing themselves. Most definitely. And even if we were to look at Amir al-Mu'mineen, you know, the, the lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the battlefield, and if it wasn't for the sword of Ali and the wealth of Khadija, then there was really no Islam at that time. Yes. How was he? I remember an incident, a story of the breaking of the bread. He couldn't break it because that was for Ali. And on the battlefield, it's qurbatan lillah. The intention couldn't be any more pure there. Look, uh, yeah, when you look at certain actions that took place during the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam in the battlefield, for example, the, the famous one about uh, the door of Khaybar, right? So, Imam Ali alayhi salam was able to lift the door or to open the door by himself, although it needed so many men to, to do it. So, it ha, ha, this was uh, a miraculous act. We can look at it as a miraculous act. How did he achieve that? by training every single day. But yeah, even uh, most of the men in the battlefield, if not all, used to train uh, and get rid of it, but they couldn't do it. He was able to do it uh, due to having the right intention and due to having this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You train yourself physically, and you, you have to train uh, yourself for your physical body, and there's a different training for your soul. Or spirituality. A spiritual training can help you to achieve what the physical training uh, stops that. Yeah, most definitely. And if someone thinks it's a bit far fetched, you only have to look at adrenaline. Like you hear stories of normal layman parents who could lift a car or could lift a machine that they otherwise couldn't because their child was at risk or something along those lines. Mm. So 100%. then, when we look at back to Abu Abdullah Al Hussein alayhi salam, with yep. his father. Now, a lot of people tell me that uh, 
Muharram or the 10th of Muharram, Imam Hussein alayhi salam had no idea of what was to come and he was living his day, day by day. They then told me he assisted in Jamal. He fought alongside his father and he was in war. Did he have diplomatic immunity? What was his role with his father? And was he always aware of Karbala? Um, if, we, if we look at it from a social aspect, being part of the family of the Prophet, this news was known by the Prophet by his parents, uh, Imam Hussein's parents. It was known by one of the wives of the Prophet, Um Salama Radwanullah alayha. So it was a common uh, information in the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Being part of the household, we can assume that he knew about it. So that's from a social aspect. If we look at it from a theological aspect of him being an infallible imam, then also we say that from his infallibility and knowledge of the unseen, he knew about it. That's number two. Uh, number three, if we look at it from a political aspect, uh, being a wise man and a wise warrior that had a lot of experience with his father in going through uh, different battles, with fighting in different battles and understanding his environment, um, the, the, the outcome of his movement um, was obvious for him due to the experiences that he had from a political aspect. So whether from a social aspect, theological or political aspect, we can say that Imam Hussain he knew of the outcome of the, of the movement, although the intention of him going out was not for that, for, 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 for what he knew. Like his intention was not to go and kill himself. Right? His intention was to go and reform in the religion of his grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to change the, uh, the, the, the corrupted uh, leadership that existed. If that happens through him reaching power, then let it be. If that happens through him being killed, then let it be. So the question there I would ask on that is, what is the condition of shahada? Because a lot of people throw this term of shaheed. Now, shaheed, alhamdulillah, has got a, a status that not many do have or not many do achieve, you know? So a condition of a shaheed in general, does that not have to have that? Have what? Have knowledge of what they? No, no, no. So intention of a shahid. Once a shahid, from my limited understanding, is coming out on the battlefield. He's not going out to die. He's going out to reform. He's going out to make changes, and he's going out to live for eternity, yeah. if he could. So look, the, 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 the term shahid was not used in the Quran to refer to those who are killed in the path of Allah. Shahid are those who witness, who are uh, witness on the day of judgment. And Rasulullah is a shahid, Ahlulbayt, alayhi salam, shuhada, and so on. Uh, the word uh, or the term used in the Quran, yuqtal fi sabilillah, or qutilu fi sabilillah, and those who are uh, killed in the path of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the intention, or maybe this is a, a status or a level that a lot of people uh, earn to achieve. Yeah, and they, 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 they wish to achieve that, uh, that status. But their intention when they go out is not to be killed. Their intention is to, root, to change uh, the, the, the wrong things that they see. Their intention is to reform the, uh, the, the corrupted uh, systems that they see around and to protect, to protect their countries, to protect their families and so on. And we see that even today, like when after, with, with, uh, with the... Uh, with uh, the terrorist attacks that took place uh, for the past 10 years in Syria and Iraq by ISIS, we saw that uh, the believers, when they went out to the battlefield, their intention was to protect their countries, to protect the shrines, to protect the, the people, and not simply to go and die. Although they, uh, they wish for that status to, to happen. Most definitely. And all that, the main cause, if I'm not mistaken, is intention. Because... <laughs> Even in Islam, you are rewarded for your intention, and then if you act upon it, you're rewarded more. Is that not correct? 100%. With simple things, with simple things in Islam, if you do it, uh, if I now drink water, you know, and um, without having uh, any intention, it will be something mubah, permissible. But if I do it, for example, and I remember Imam al or the thirst of Imam al it becomes mustahab. 
right? Or in general, anything in life. If I want to do anything, if I want to walk outside, now I'm not in lockdown, we can't do that much, but uh, usually if I want to go and walk outside and I say, I will do that qurbatan lillahi ta'ala, with that intention, it becomes mustahab. Yes, and that is something that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the uh, progeny of Nabi Adam. Because when Nabi Adam asked, why is Satan getting such a, uh, a run to the Day of Judgment? And then that was one of the conditions. If you have an intention, yeah. reward you. So that's why I hear a lot of ulama or any lectures I watch, write it down and it's a, as if you did that. And then if you act upon it and your intention is pure enough, inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to come up with a cure for COVID. Inshallah, pure, inshallah. So, so yeah, we move on from that and we see um, Abba Abdullah al Hussein plays a role with his father and he's almost in the life of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. Do we ever see traditions of Sayyid al-Shuhada? It's almost all Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam and he's behind his brother. Yeah, it's uh, one of the good lessons that the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam teaches us is to be organized. To organize ourselves and when it comes to the social political aspect they teach us that you can't have two leaders there must be one leader same as you can't have two drivers driving a car you end up crashing but you need to have one driver so although imam al hassan and imam al hussein alayhi salam are Infallibles, Masumin, Sayyidai Shababi, Ahl al Jannah, they have the same status. But with that, because Imam al Hassan was appointed as the Imam after his father, Imam al Hussain was obedient to the leadership of Imam al Hassan. In some narrations, or one of the narrations from Imam al Sadiq, he says, Ma mashal Hussain wa bayna yaday al Hassan qat. Madmunan. I mean, Imam al Hussein didn't walk in front of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, not even for once. So, even when they used to walk, Imam al Hussein used to walk behind his brother because Imam al Hassan is the leader and he supported his leadership. This is something uh, honestly amazing in the, in the lives of the Al Bayt alayhi salam. And even for those who don't believe in their infallibility, when they look at the, the, their life and how they live the, the, their lives, they can uh, see that uh, they were they were uh, holy people and even if they don't want to believe in their infallibility now we see uh, brothers killing themselves in history for leadership we see we see uh, brothers like al amin and al mamun the children of al harun right he killed his brother but with imam al hussein he was very obedient to his brother imam al hussein and this should be a lesson Allah, it should be a lesson for us today to be organized to be organized most it's, not about, it's not about who's in the position of leadership. It's not about, let's, let me say, not about everyone being in a position of leadership. It's about having the right person in that position and supporting them. Most definitely. And you know what makes me sad is we always fall victim to what we point the finger to others. You know, a lot of people hate on Osama bin Zayed because nobody jumped on board with him. And nobody supported that movement. I mean, we didn't do that either. But well, how do we know we won't be like the uh, companions of the Prophet that he sends La'ana on who doesn't go with Usama because Usama was young and I'm 45 and I'm 55 and I'm 70 years old. So that's very important in that sense to the most accredited person and you get behind such a person and you, you serve Qurbatan Allah. It shouldn't be I. The I shouldn't be involved in that. And I also yeah. learned that from Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. The... Uh, one of my favorite stories from him is the um, when he used to come from Masjid al Nabawi to tell his mother Fatima Tazhara salam Allah alayha of the khutbah of what used to happen. And it was just a yeah. cute moment she wanted to share with Amir al Mu'mineen. If you care to share about that and the importance of not speaking in front of someone who's of more knowledge. Yeah, 100%. Like, yeah. It shows how she even encouraged her son uh, to, to do that, and it's like she said to him, keep uh, telling me what, what's happening at the khutbah, and uh, that encouraged him to listen more, obviously, to, to what is being said in the khutbah. So this shows practical uh, steps that they used to follow in teaching their children. Although they are infallibles, but this is a lesson for us to follow. Most of put our down to encourage them, to support them, uh, and, and so on. Yeah? Most definitely. So if the people don't know what exactly the story was, so 
um, like we said, Mama Hassan used to go to the home and say the Fatima, as the Sheikh said, encourage him to talk. So she wanted to share that with Amir al muminin once he came home. So the day that Imam Ali alayhi salam was hiding behind, Imam al Hassan walks in and usually he's ready to spill exactly what had happened. This time he doesn't, he's quiet. Now his mother asks Hassan Bunay, why are you quiet? He's like, there's someone of more valor, someone that he's got more knowledge. I, I don't have a platform to speak in the presence no. of such a man. So th that's another lesson we can take. And also, you could see why Imam Hussein, salam, like we said earlier, the Sheikh said, takes a backward step because there's one leader, one Imam, one yeah. Sayyid, one Mawla, and that was Amir al muminin yeah. Let it be, if, if, uh, let it be uh, the fact that you, you have someone who is higher than you, like let's say Imam Ali, salam, Imam Hassan, salam, or even having someone that is equal to you, like Imam Hussain, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain, even if they are equal, but just for have, having a leader, one leader, the one that is equal to him shouldn't be firing to be in that position, but rather they should support that, that person that is in, in, in leadership. So let's say today you have two people that are equal. They have the same knowledge, the same piety, the same wisdom. Uh, and one of them is appointed as the leader. The other person shouldn't become jealous and try to destroy that leader. We learn from the Imam to, to support him in his leadership for the interest of Islam. Most definitely. And we only have to look at Talha and Zubair, how they treat, you know, they were Sahabis of the Prophet. Push came to shove, leadership in a side. Is it not a hadith from Imam al Ridha alayhi salam? And if someone's your equal, you look at them that they've done better and you've done more worse, or you're not aware of their sins. So it's always looking at someone at a higher status. If someone's younger, they've sinned less than you. If someone's older, they've done better than you for longer than you. So, like you're saying, it, it's subhanAllah, it's all there. You just need the people to reflect, you know, not like your fathers and forefathers. You don't inherit religion, you have to mm. acquire religion, you have to go out and seek. And what's sufficient for me doesn't mean it's sufficient for everyone. You have to find your own path. You have to endeavor. You have to do your own jihad. Jihad the nafs is the biggest jihad from the Holy Prophet. The first verse, Iqra, read in the name of your Lord. Go look at any of the Abrahamic faiths. The first of each scripture is all to do with read and think. And in Al-Kafi, Sheikh, now what's the first chapter? Yeah, al yes. Intellect. So when, he, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qarram bani Adam and ahsan taqween, I'm sure that the T-Rex were a bit more built than us and all these other previous uh, creations of Allah, it's the intellect that he blessed us with. And that's, I feel, something that we, we, we don't really appreciate or we don't celebrate. You know, we always celebrate the person who does something wrong because we're scared of him to point out his flaws. You know, I never forget Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah in one of his speeches, he's like, don't go to their funerals, don't open your doors, don't let him in. And unfortunately, the re one of the reasons why we're not as, you know, organized as we are. You look at Imam al-Hassan, Imam al-Hussein, structurally, leadership-wise, it's because we cater for all these people. They put on a pedestal and, mashallah, he does half a good act and he's put, he's up there, he might have some, radiallahu uh, anh, next to his name, in about two seconds. <laughs> so we see that. I, always, I also want to touch, before we move on from Imam al-Hassan, alayhi salam, on his valor, and especially in Jaman. How was Imam al Hassan alayhi salam? So now Amir al Mu'minin, nobody comes near him in war. Imam al Hassan almost gets overlooked. In Islamic history, as a warrior, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, where does he sit? Is he greater than, is it in order? Is he greater than Abu Abdullah in that sense? Please do share what you know. There are different of opinions about the status of the Ahl al Bayt alayhi salam. Is it, um, is it in order? Who is uh, who comes first? We know obviously Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi comes first. He's the master and the leader uh, and uh, the best of uh, prophets, even of the Luhalqillah sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi. So the, the, the prophet comes first. Some people believe Imam Ali second and Imam al Hassan third, Imam al Hussein. So in order. And after Imam al Hussein, they go to Imam al Mahdi al Sharif, and then the rest of the Imam. This is one of the opinions. Uh, another opinion is that in, uh, in, in essence, they are all equal. Because in essence, they are one. The, it's like when you have now this light around you, 
this light comes from uh, the sun outside with the help of some electricity yeah. but outside the sun outside it uh, brings the light here this light is not separate from the sun it is one and the same thing with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Ahlul Bayt. The source of everything is Rasulullah. And they are a reflection of this uh, divine mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa um, This is something that, I'm, uh, that I believe in more personally. I believe in essence they are one. Um, with the, with the source being Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. However, in this life, when they appeared in this life, uh, maybe we can follow the order that they came in. And we can classify Imam Ali alayhi salam to be better uh, than the rest of the, the Imams alayhi salam after him. Different opinions when it comes to Aqeedah. No. Uh, some people they use some of the narrations said by the Imams, for example, Mata Abi Wa Khairun Minni, Mata Akhi Wa Khairun Minni. Imam Hussain says that some narrations that my father died and he was better than me, Imam Hassan died and he was better than me. But it's a long discussion, uh, on, on, and uh, inshallah, it needs a separate um, discussion altogether. No, no, that's 100%. And but. As for valor on the battlefield, I do recall Muhammad bin Hanafiya not being pushed as much, and Imam Ali alayhi salam had to pull Imam Hassan back because of the responsibility that was to come. Yeah, just as a side note, every time you say valor, I remember Valhalla from Vikings, so this is a problem. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, I don't watch Vikings, man. I tried, a lot of people try to get me to watch TV. I don't really stick to these shows. I do watch some stuff, but it's more sport. <laughs> so I'm going to use a new word now, <laughs> not valor. <laughs> so anyway, with Imam, uh, Imam uh, Ali alayhi salam in Jamal, he was uh, yeah, fighting. It was the first uh, war between Muslims. And uh, obviously there, there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from Jamal. But specifically about Imam Hazan alayhi salam, they say that uh, Imam Ali asked Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, one of his children, to... Uh, to get the camel down, to chop the, the, the camel's legs so it can fall, then the people will stop fighting just to end the war because the leader of the of the other army was on the camel. So they needed to get the camel down to stop the war. And Muhammad ibn Hafiyah, he couldn't do it. Then uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam sent Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam to do it and he was able to bring the camel down. Uh, it shows how brave uh, Imam Hussain was. Because unfortunately, a lot of people they say we have the Husseini uh, approach and the Hassani approach. You know, the Hassani approach is passive to be passive, and the Husseini approach is to, to be active. No, both both of them were warriors. Both of them were uh, strong fighters. And if Imam Hussain uh, existed during the time of Imam Hussain, he would have done the same thing as Imam Hussain. Um, in fact, the Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, he is compared to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi more than anyone else. They used, to, they, they used to say that he used to look like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, even physically. And no one was stronger than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, not even Imam Ali alayhi salam. Yeah, Imam Ali with all his bravery, in some, uh, in some sources it says that when it used to become intense in the battlefield and everyone comes from everywhere, everywhere we used to stand behind Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Rasulullah didn't used to sit on his throne and just tell people go fight. He was the bravest warrior. The same thing with Imam Hassan alayhi salam. Most definitely. And it's something that I wish to point, especially because for me, I don't know if I'm mistaken in saying this. I feel Imam al Hassan, Imam Hussein alayhi salam is a Hassan. It's a Imam al Hassan's approach because if you look in the life of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, the sulh of al Hassan was something that Abu Abdullah lived with. He only waited until every condition was broken before he even thought of making a move. And even before he made the move, it's only because uh, Yazid the Lain was to say, even if he was holding onto the Kaaba, which we know the sanctity of the heart around the Kaaba, that is to be killed. And it was rather out of the uh, best interest of the Muslim Ummah moving forward. that He didn't want to put his blood in this path and he started to move. If that's not mistaken, that's Al-Hassani. Is that not correct? 
They are say very, very all the Imams alayhi salam, they had the godly approach. No. Or a divine approach, you know, instead of using Hassani and Husseini. <clears throat> it's a divine approach. All of them had the same. And this is why I said with the discussion of them being equal or not, it's a long discussion. But all of them they have the same approach and the same way of thinking. But it depends on the time that they're living in. For example, Imam Ali alayhi salam had to be more political, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam had to sign an agreement, Imam al Hussein had to start a, a revolution, a, a, a military movement, Imam Salik had to start an educational movement, and so on. So different ways of approaching, but the cause is one uh, from, from the Ahlul Ahl Bayt uh, alayhi salam. Uh, and uh, it's important to study the time that they, 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 they existed in to see why they ended up doing this. If you look all the way, even to Muawiyah, up to Muawiyah, and those who came to leadership in Islam from the first and all the way to Muawiyah, publicly, they used to present themselves as pious uh, believers, as pious Muslims, even Muawiyah. Muawiyah, he used to uh, give lectures, he is Katib al-Wahi, he used to write the, the Wahi during the time of the Prophet, his uh, wife, his, uh, his sister is married to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi So he's Khalul Mu'mineen, the uncle of the believers. So yani he's looked upon as a pious believer back then, in, in, in Asham especially. And he brainwashed the people in Asham to make them believe that he is the Ahlul Bayt. Yani one of the verses, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ يُذْهِبْ عَنْكُمُ الرِّسْلَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Ahlul Bayt is who? Muawiyah. Because his sister is married to the Prophet, you know? So yani, he was, they all presented themselves as pious believers. Now we look at Muawiyah, oh, Muawiyah, can, he was this, that. But publicly, no, he was, uh, he was uh, presenting himself as a pious Muslim. With the Yazid, it became different. With the Yazid, publicly, he started uh, exposing the sins that others didn't. From drinking, from committing adultery, from changing religion, from... Uh, planning to attack the Kaaba from doing so many things. So it became the obligation for Imam Ghazal to stand against this public oppression and this public injustice that was taking place. Most definitely. And once uh, Muawiyah passes, it goes on to Yazid. And yes. Sir John, the Roman, who was also an advisor for Muawiyah, tells him mm -hmm. you're going to have a bit of problems with someone. Uh, he named him four names, and one of the names was Abu Abdullah Al Hussein. So now mm -hmm. it changes. It's almost like now there's a bounty on Imam Hussein alayhi salam and he has to cut his hajj short. Talk to us about that time and that struggle and how the journey starts from there and the khutbah he gives to the people warning them of what's to come. Look, the, the, the journey of uh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam and inshallah I'm planning to do a series of lectures about that uh, after Muharram. The journey started after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So after the Imam Hassan alayhi salam uh, passed away or was killed, Muawiyah decided to hold the conference in Asham and invite the sons of the companions to, uh, to go and uh, give bay'ah to Yazid. Although he agreed that the, he, he would not give the Khilafah to his son. So many people went to give bay'ah to Yazid, but some of the children of the companion in Medina decided not to go because they didn't accept Yazid to be the Khalifa after his father. Uh, one, of, one of them is the, the son of Imam Ali alayhi salam, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, the son of, uh, the, the son of, um, al, uh, what's his name? Uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, ala Muhammad, uh, Zubair, the son of Al-Zubair, Ibn Zubair was one of them that didn't accept. Uh, the son of Ibn Abbas, Abdullah, didn't accept Abdullah ibn Abbas, didn't accept. Uh, the son of uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab didn't accept. So they all joined together, the, the sons of the, of the children of the Sahaba, the companions joined together against the bay'ah of uh, Muhammad. And they appointed Imam al salam as the leader of the opposition in Medina against Muawiyah and the bay'ah of Yazid. That was after the demise of or the martyrdom of Imam al salam now, later on, some of them changed, if not all of them changed and betrayed, but Imam Ghazali salam, he, he stood firm against that. And due to his stance, Muawiyah, he enforced uh, uh, financial sanctions on the house of Imam Ghazali salam, preventing him from receiving any money. 
And this is something that people don't speak about, or maybe they haven't heard before. Uh, it reached the stage where Imam Ghazali couldn't have enough money to feed his family. And anyone that used to help him, he used to be punished by, by, by Muawiyah. So he lived a very difficult time uh, after, the, after Imam Hassan And all the way when he decided to go to, to Karbala, long story there why he went to Karbala, we'll leave it for later. Uh, in, the interesting part is in, uh, in Mecca, in the Hajj, in, in deciding uh, to stop the Hajj and continue to, to, to Karbala. Uh, so Muawiyah sent some people to kill Imam Hussein in Mecca. Obviously, he sent some people to speak to him, to discuss with him, to convince him not to go. Not Muawiyah, sorry, Yazid. Yazid sent people to, to kill Imam Hussein in Mecca. He sent some people to speak to him. He didn't listen, then he sent some people to kill, to kill him. So he decided to leave the Hajj before it ends and continue to, uh, to Karbala or to Al Kufa. The interesting another point that I, that I always talk about is uh, the Imam alayhi salam stopping an important ritual being the Hajj to go perform uh, something that he believed to be obligation during his time. And this should, makes us, uh, should, should make us reflect on the importance of being relevant when it comes to religion and how to relate to things in our time. Even with the most important rituals, we shouldn't limit ourselves to them. Sometimes our obligation is to stop a certain ritual in order to ensure the continuation of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is exactly what Imam Masa did. He stopped the Hajj, which is the most important ritual in Islam, in order to ensure uh, this religion to continue. Yeah, most definitely. And... Uh... When you were saying what you're saying, and I took it 100% on board, and my personal experience, I was blessed, alhamdulillah, mostly because of the guests on the podcast might have inspired me with a video that he did release a long time ago that Hajj is greater than his yara. So then, inshallah, the Niyyah became to go to Hajj, and after Hajj, in the same trip, I was blessed to go to, you know, where everyone wants to, to Karbala to visit the Master. And I was there for the Ashr, the 10th of Muharram. I remember the night of the 10th. I was at the Husseiniya of um, Ayatollah well, Sayyid Muhammad Taqil Muda. Oh, you're not me today? Okay, I won't name. All right. So I was at. Everyone. <laughs> okay, so I was somewhere and I was telling them what's the program. You know, I'm usually uh, used to listening to the Maqtal and one, two, three, four, so I can make sure I'm prepared. So uh, I was told, look, this is what happens in the morning. I go, oh, no, that happens in the morning. I go, yeah, I don't want to be a part of this in the morning. So something that is ritualistic that people do do might be self-flagellation. And now, look, my opinion is I don't think there's a time and place for it. However, I'm open to, I do understand people will enjoy it and it might be a way of them expressing themselves. I might share that you could do much more beneficial things, but each to their own, there's one Maliki or Medin, one judge, and that ain't me, and it's never going to be me. However, that's the opinion I share, and that's what I took from what you were saying. I'm, you know, there's a time and place where even Imam Sadiq has that hadith not to be of an embarrassment to us because at once I've, so, I've had this discussion so many times. I'm like, okay, let's just play this procession of you running up and down and trampling each other. And then you guys are lagellating yourselves. Let's put it on CNN on the 10th and let's see how long Abu Abdullah's message is. I mean, you're hijacking the message. And, of course, yes. and I, they get defensive as if that, you know, you're just a little kid. I'm like, look, I'm happy for you to give me one reason. Give me one good reason or one hadith that's strong and it's not from the plaster of, I think it was uh, Muawiyah's plaster or someone along those lines. Like, bro, or uh, someone fell on a pole and then, how did it fall in? The, the same Zainab who said, Mara aytu illa jameel, as Zainab who started doing this. I don't know who you're talking about. It's not my Zainab. But it's, it's just interesting that the message of Abu Abdullah is greater than all of us. And as well, you know, where he's sharing our personal experience and how much it means to us and in this lockdown it's just it's a different platform by no means does this replace a majlis or a place you read in the book or you know looking through the maqtal or the letters because when the sheikh was talking about muawiyah i was shocked when i first read his letters how he structured himself and from amir whatever it's not that he was that then i read them i'll never forget the letter i read from abba abdullah to muslim ibn Aqil. 
that letter shook me. It was straight to the point. It was direct. It was the letter when Muslim told, sent to Abu Abdullah, he said that the trip has bad omen. If I'm not mistaken, he, the two journeymen had died from severe dehydration and he didn't feel that there was good karma from going towards Kufa. And then the response, and I'm paraphrasing, I definitely don't remember it, from Abu Abdullah was, continue the mission, don't take, your, don't take the coward's way out. I'm like, oh, well. And I read the other bloke's message and he's like, beautiful. From this and Bismillah and, you know, Makhalesh, everything. From who he is and what his status is. And if he ever gave charity, I'm sure he put it in the letter. And Abu Abdullah was straight to the point, do what you got to do. And I'm like, uh-huh. Don't be, don't be amused or don't be, you know, don't fall victim to these people who dress like they're from, not talking about yourself, but they're from pirates of the Caribbean, you know? And they feel like they're entitled. They shake your hand as if they're half dying. You're know, like, mate, Muslim Ibn Aqil was a warrior of all warriors. Go look at him in Sufin. Go look at him with Amir al muminin The hadith from the Prophet, he liked, he liked his father two loves for the love of Aqil and for the love of Muslim. I mean, none of us got that rap from the Prophet. So it's crazy to see the context and the message of how Abu Abdullah's message is universal and it's for us to take upon ourselves. Look, uh, with the, I'll go back to the ritual and then I'll connect it to what you said, the very important points you mentioned. With the rituals, uh, some of the rituals are part of religion, like the Hajj. Hajj is a ritual. Sha'a'illah. It is part of religion. And some of the rituals are not part of religion. Rituals in general are a way to advertise your religion. So you can look at rituals as sha'ir as means to promote a certain message. So what you have now, what we're doing now, it can be classified as a sha'ira, right? Because you're advertising a certain message. Now, with the sha'ir of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, there's no uh, authentic evidence uh, that they were practiced in the past by the Imams alayhi salam. Uh, referring to tadbir, for example, hitting the head and that, there's no evidence for it from an authentic narration. And I gave a course uh, in regards to this topic few, uh, two years ago, right? And I think that the, the discussion is online. Uh, the articles are online. Uh, the, so I, I looked at all the narrations that are used and I showed that there are weak narrations about say the Zainab hitting your head and, and the rest of them. But in general, they uh, say to you, this act is uh, mubah, it's permissible, it's allowed. You know, we say yes, but then there's another ruling uh, of not causing harm to your religion or to your message. And this is a logical ruling, because if you want to promote something, you have to uh, find a wise way of approaching others in order for you to make them believe in that message. So it's more important to protect the message of Imam al instead of trying to protect some of the rituals that existed in history. Unfortunately, today, some people, they concentrate on the rituals, let it be from Latam, from, uh, from uh, hitting the heads, more than concentrating on the message of Imam Hussain They surrounded themselves in that circle of rituals without doing anything uh, in, in, on the outside. It's similar, and I'll link that to what you said at the end, to, to compare between what, how Muawiyah used to present himself in a very eloquent way, writing, in a very emotional way, and the way Imam Hussain used to write, in a very uh, straightforward stay way. Uh, you see, a lot of people, a lot of people, they, uh, let's say, theoretically, they present themselves as warriors, as lions, but throw them in a battle and you'll see that they are a, a cat. Let me use the term cat instead of using other terms. So, uh, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do, you know. You can say whatever you want, but you judge someone based on the actions that they take. And this is how we judge our Imams al -Islam. The Imams al never used to uh, sit on the member and speak for half an hour or 40 minutes. Right? They used to give short lectures, short speeches, and then go to do practical things in the lives of people, to change the lives of people. But, um, and that, uh, today, you sit down, some people, they speak for 40 minutes. Wallahi, yani, you get uh, bored uh, and you want to leave the whole religion because, <laughs> because of them. I usually go late sometimes to the, to the mosque so I can uh, yani, escape from listening to, to them. Right? Type of, yani, it's boring. It gets boring. 
it's it's not about how much you say or how you say it, it's about the actions that you take. And to say that now, if we will link it to the message of Imam Hussain, we should see on a personal level how much this message is helping us in changing to become better Muslims, stronger Muslims, how to represent ourselves where we're living, and also as a community to see if we are if we if we were successful in learning from this message of Imam Hussain in organizing ourselves and in representing ourselves. Most definitely, and just to take part, uh, take out one of the lessons from Abu Abdullah, you know, uh, when Al Hur intercepted him and it was a time of Salah, I'll never forget when he told him, You go lead the prayers. He comes to our communities, certain people come and step up, and he, half the crowd have ran out. Yeah, there's always that part. I don't know why it's like you know, that you're leading angels to, to paradise, but you're leading to three, four people <laughs> at the mosque. And that's it, I'm sure there's nothing special about that. Uh, I mean, again, this reflects the, the weakness of some people. Because as I said before, if someone is strong, if someone is secure, uh, they don't even compare themselves to others. They don't look at someone and feel they are jealous from them. Because they know that they have certain strength, they have certain weakness. And the other person, they also he has certain strength and weakness. Uh, everyone has his own journey in life, and everyone can uh, leave a print, let's say, on the sands of time that is different than the print of the other person. Most definitely, most definitely. And to wrap it up, because it's been um, informative, and honestly, the pleasure is all mine, and I'm very thankful for your time, and inshallah, Thank the you. people watching, you know, enjoy it to an extent. But what is our responsibility to the Imam, the Qa'im, from Al-Muhammad, that is amongst us? <laughs> That is amongst us. Oh, I said the key word. I should have stood up as well. So it is amongst us. What is our responsibility with the message of Imam Hussain alayhi salam and implementing it to do justice to him and the message? Um, I believe uh, the first responsibility would be to educate ourselves more about Islam. If we want to be uh, true Muslims, and I'll link it to what we said at the beginning. If you want to be a true Husseini and to do something on a practical side, you need to start by building a strong foundation in uh, studying your religion. And studying the religion shouldn't be limited to books or lectures, but rather it should be uh, in trying to have a special connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is ritual life where you feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the most important thing. As much as we love the Imams alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, but uh, they are the creatures of a creator. And we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first. The tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first. So having that relation can help us to fulfill our obligation towards our Imam alayhi uh, salam, the Imam of our time, and towards the message of Imam al-Hussain alayhi salam. And yani, when you look at the, even Karbala, even the last moments of Abi Abdullah al-Hussain alayhi salam, you can see uh, the purity of Tawheed in his words, in thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in always relating everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yani great lessons that we can learn from in having that strong relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then everything you do, do for the sake of Allah. Whatever happens to you, to you say Alhamdulillah. And this is something that Imam Hussain said uh, before he, he was killed. He said Alhamdulillah. He praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second thing is to uh, learn more about our Imams alayhi salam. Also, again, not theoretically, but also to, to try to practically benefit from the lessons of the Imams alayhi salam. Um, to promote the message of uh, Imam al-Hussain alayhi salam in a wise way. Because uh, this message of Imam al-Hussain alayhi salam, it dominates all uh, the other uh, messages of the Imams or the rest of the Imams. Yani, whether we like it or not, there's a special place for Imam al-Hussain alayhi salam. And sometimes they say, oh, you don't do justice to the rest of the Imams. You mentioned Imam Hussein more than others. Now, this is something that the Ahlul Bayt wanted. 
امام علي عليه السلام سيد لا يومك يا يومك يا ابا عبد الله امام الحسن سيد لا يومك يا يومك يا ابا عبد الله there's no day like your day يا ابا عبد الله بس يعني we can use this uh, message and promote it in a wise way to attract people because you can attract a lot of people through the message of Imam Ghazali. So let me give you a, a, an example. I know I'll talk a lot, but I'll try to cut it short. No, no there's no time in my I enjoy podcasts because you can do whatever you want. Okay, continue. So, usually I'm, I'm used to people at the mosque telling me, oh, it's time to talk. <laughs> You're talking too long. Yeah. It's, uh, anyway. <laughs> Look at, for example, in Christianity, how they how they became the most popular religion in the world through using the story of Jesus, alayhi salam, and the crucifixion of Jesus and the oppression of Jesus and the pain of Jesus, right? And they promoted it in movies, promoted it in uh, in shows, and it attracted a lot of people. Right? But we can do the same thing when it comes to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Habibi, instead of spending $50,000 sometimes in, in a Husayniya or a mosque, feeding people every night, you can collect this money, right, and build something, a proper movie, to promote the message of Imam al-Husayn, So people are spending more than $1,000, $2,000 a night on food. We don't need to be fed in, in, in any center or Husayniya. Everyone is financially, alhamdulillah, capable of uh, feeding <laughs> themselves and other stuff. Why should we waste all that money uh, for 10 nights uh, feeding people? Go and use this money and uh, do something to promote the message of Imam Hussain. And yeah, to, 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 to end it, I'll say, inshallah, we can learn from the message of Imam Hussain how to unite. Number one, how to unite around the love of Allah, the love of the Prophet, and the love of the Arab faith, and how to be organized, and how to have a, a, a proper vision, and to have a plan, a short term plan, and a long term plan as a community. This is how we keep the message of the Imam alive, and this is how we connect to the Imam of our time, until Allah Ta'ala. No, Ahsan, Ahsan, Sheikh. No. And no. final message for the people in lockdown a lot of people are finding it tough. They might be not knowing how to best spend their time. How could this be a positive thing for them to reflect on everything you said and more? Um, look, uh, we, we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything that happens. And uh, I think uh, lockdown can be positive in uh, forcing us to change our lifestyle. We have been, uh, or people here, I can't speak about myself, but I've been through more difficult uh, times. But people in this country, they've never been through any uh, big difficulties. Like, they never went through any uh, pro big problems or big issues or that stuff. So this is the first time they face such a pandemic, you know, and they feel lost. And this is a positive thing. I see it as a positive thing because it makes you, the shocking system can. Uh, help to awaken a lot of things that are hidden inside of you. And especially as a Muslim. Now, you can't go to many places. You can't meet with people. You are forced to be with yourself and to sit with yourself, whether you like it or not, for, for, a, for a long time, for a long period of time. So, one of the main lessons that the Adul Bayt used to concentrate on is uh, to... Uh, to have uh, to, to to try to do jihad al nafs or self accountability, muhasabatul nafs, self accountability. Laysa minna man lam yuhasab nafsa. Imam al Qadim alayhi salam says, "It's not from us the one that doesn't do self accountability." This is a uh, this is a yani, a chance for us to uh, sit down and reflect on ourselves, to reflect on our life, our and to reflect on the relation with Allah subhanahu wa taala. And number two, to reflect on what we are doing in this life. Yani, how, old, how old am I now? What have I achieved in my life so far? What I want to achieve in the future? How I want to achieve these things in the future? I need to be comfortable within my own skin in order for me to get anywhere I want in life. And uh, yani, it's sad to see that as a community or as individuals, we always put ourselves down. We always think, no, it's not possible for me to do this. It's not possible for me to do that. As they say, we we'll always see the grass greener on the other side. 
and we don't appreciate the good things uh, until we lose them. Hala, this is a good time in lockdown to start to appreciate the good things that we have, to reflect on ourselves and to be comfortable with our own self in order to get somewhere in life, inshallah. No, ahsant, ahsant, honestly, very informative. Uh, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, You're welcome. Ajak and Allah and Al Hussein alayhi salam inshallah. And inshallah, we'll see all this sadaqa and sadaqa jaria in continuance. Inshallah, it helps if it's one person. We've done more than enough. Myself, I was helped and blessed with this meeting. Thank you very much. Usually, I do a quirky wear out, but in for the month of Muharram, I'm not. So, we're going to have to do a wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Allah ma'akum.